Okay, let's see. Hey, there I am. Oh, another commercial. Um, some sort of audio going on here. Let's see. Today, fast track options available with courses oh, in cybersecurity, okay. cloud computing, and systems architecture. Find your purpose at Grand Canyon University. Visit gcu.edu slash IT. Hey all, welcome to let's go to theater mode. I think that works. That works. Hey all, welcome to and still trying to figure this out. Um, I don't see my chat. Let's see, where is it? Oh, there we are. Chat. So let's go there. And then to little theater mode, keep my chat. There we are. Chat. And close that. Add. Okay. Um, looks like I might be flying solo. Um, at the moment? Oh no, actually I got four viewers. I I don't know how to see see any of that stuff. Um, whispers. I don't know how to show who's 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 here, who's not. But anyhow, if you're watching, thank you very much. Um, okay, so I'm just going to go ahead and start and get into it. Um, last time I left off, I was working on this uh, Black Panther by Philip Tan. Um, Last time hey, I Rob. Hey, Rob. Uh, you're here. Good. Uh, uh, one of my great uh, flatters who's gone on to be a great uh, colorist, great too. Cat. Uh, 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 I'll just call you a cat because I cannot pronounce the whole pronounce thing. The whole thing. Flatters, Looks great thus far. Thank you very much. Um, can, can you guys hear me? I'm using a different headset today. Um, I do not know if I've got things calibrated. So if, you, if I am not um, speaking in this video, please let me know. Okay. Okay. Uh, so, so, last time, last, last time uh, on Tuesday, it was, it was my first stream first ever, and I started, started um, this so Black Panther Black piece Panther by, by Philip Tan. Tan. It was, here's, well, that's kind of where the, <laughs> we can hear you, but you're echoing. Oh, great. Um, that's kind of where the, Let's see, that might be an OBS thing. Desktop audio, let's mute that. Hopefully that, that fixes it. Okay, if that doesn't fix it, I really don't know what else to do. Um, hopefully it's not the webcam picking it up, but it might be. Um, okay, so I was uh, on Tuesday working on this Philip Tan Black Panther piece. Um, I got a bit of a ways. Oh, perfect. Sweet. Thank you. Um, again, this is only my second live stream, so the noob issues will probably continue throughout the, the stream. Um, so I was working on Black Panther. Um, I saw this online, thought it was great with all the reviews coming out of the new Black Panther movie, which seems very sweet. I have not watched the the previews or the reviews because I do not like to do that. Um, I like to go into a movie blind, but I know it's getting a lot of press, so I thought I would snag a Black Panther piece, and Philip Tan's work is always awesome, and found this online. He gave me permission to use it for the stream, and here we are. Um, last episode, I flatted it and got in some rough rendering, um, put in a few lights, walked through things. Oh, Zach. <laughs> okay. Got it. Uh, hey, Zach. <laughs> okay. Um, so, yeah. Again, the whole talking, reading, and drawing thing at the same time is not my forte. But today I'm going to try and hopefully finish off this piece. It has gone into a much more painterly uh, way than I expected when I started it. Um, probably because it's not for print for a publisher. I feel uh, relaxed enough to just do whatever the hell I feel like. Um but I will probably tighten it up quite a bit. It might end up being more of a fully painted piece by the time I'm done. Uh, we'll see how much effort I want to put into it, though. So, um, what should I do? I should probably 
if I'm going to take it to a fully painted piece, I need to push a lot more of this line work out and uh, create more of a, a volume instead of a line drawing. Um, the focus really needs to be on the figure. Um, the background I'm kind of keeping loose because I want it to fade and recede and look like not quite an out of focus, but something that's more of a textured background and not so much a reality of depicting every leaf in the background. I think when people go crazy on some backgrounds, it can be a distraction more than a benefit. Um, it shows great draftsmanship, but as far as storytelling um, in the comics medium, I think if you push too many little details into the background, um, you end up losing some of the clarity of storytelling because you want people... Comics is a very fast-paced reading medium, and if you get bogged down and looking at every little leaf in the background, you're sucking yourself out of the story. That's my personal philosophy. Other people differ um, and are very successful at it as well. So the problem with uh, having a couple days between a piece like this is I don't remember what all my layers were because as a, a, a bad example, I did not label things um, because I usually just create layers, merge them, create, adjust, and whatever. So that's, I know I do need to, I was looking at it when I was watching my, a bit of my recording and realized that I lost a whole bunch of visual information, reflections, uh, volume in the mask area. So I should probably go back in and start cleaning that up a little bit. I'm just going to use the standard hard round brush. Um, that is one of my favorite go-to brushes um, just because it allows me to have the control I want um, and still be able to uh, be expressive enough for what what I think is necessary for the piece. The I use the chalk brush a lot. The this chalk here. Um, actually, make it big because it creates a really nice um, blendable edge that's that's not quite as as harsh. But I do think that um, when you get into a lot of the concept art drawings and stuff, a lot of people. Um, that I have learned from use just the standard hard round and lend a lot. And there are definitely benefits to doing it that way um, that I think create a really nice look. Um, but for comic work um, that's within already has a bounding line, a lot of times I like to use uh, the chalk brush to keep things moving along in a smoothed out uh, method. So I'm going to kind of harden up that edge just a little bit to, to, to bring it into focus. Um, a lot of times what, what I will probably end up doing is putting the line drawing back over top of this um, to make sure I'm hitting all the right notes. A um, little music metaphor, but I kind of consider the uh, the line artist, when I'm working on a painted piece, uh, you could probably consider him like the composer, and I am the musician who actually is bringing that composition to a specific life. Um, each, each I don't know how many of you are music people, but I'm very musical. Um, in the listening now, I used to be in the making of it. But anyhow, um, I think that the artists have... Uh, colors painting over it will have a lot of voice in what the final piece looks like even if we all had the same underlying drawing and I think to be able to bring out your own unique take on it like a good musician can um, even like a you know, something as highly scripted as a, a you know a Beethoven symphony you can still get depending on who's who's playing it you'll get a different feel, get a different context. Um, it kind of brings me, I, I've been watching, probably waxing a little philosophical on this because I've been watching some Twitter posts <laughs> lately, which I know, bad idea, but I have been. And between some, I don't know, some guy, <laughs> I, I won't say who, and a bunch of professional 
very well respected writers and they are trying to explain to this guy that it's not just about the writer that the um the story is completely changed based on who's drawing it that there's a not completely changed but that it it's different depending who draws it it's not the just the writer only doing his thing it's the uh collaborative effort which makes uh, a unique piece out of every Every story would be different depending on who drew it, um, even with the exact same script. Holy cabooses, colorists are hot. I assume you're referring to a, a orange color and not me. <laughs> um, okay. Um, so yeah, I, I, I'm definitely pushing this into the uh, painterly way. You can tell I have fairly much gone over uh, many of his, much of his line work. Um, I would originally do it to uh, blend, uh, uh, create a sense of light in the backgrounds, um, between the figure and the backgrounds, so that, you know, I, I, I don't, I know it's ironic considering I work in comic books where everything's uh, line work, but well, not everything. A lot of the major comics are, are based on line work. And I think in terms of shape and value and not line, I suppose that's probably why I'm a colorist and my painting background comes into play there. Um, my, my background, for those of you who do not know, uh, is in traditional canvas, uh, oil on canvas painting. Ooh, I just got a... That'd be my phone notification. Probably some Google survey that I'm ignoring. Um, so yeah. So as you can see, when I zoom in, these things are very rough, and that's that's fine. Uh, it will tighten up as I go, theoretically. Um, if I'm doing this a full full on painted piece, it will. The things that I, that need focus and sharpening will be focused and sharpened theoretically. Okay, so um, I guess that brings me to another point that uh, when creating focus, I, I actually think that's um, a major part of a colorist job is is that that sense of leading the viewer through the story. In this case, the story is a pinup, but it's still theoretically... Um, I'm late. I am here. I was washing the car. Really? I got a, I got two cars that washed. Come on over. Um, no, thanks for, thanks for showing up, man. Um, so, colors tell a story through the use of color, obviously. Color, volume, um, all that fun stuff. What drives a, a, a viewer in the story isn't necessarily the subject matter. Auto hygiene is important. True. Uh, <laughs> uh, so having a... Um, oh, yeah, storytelling. <laughs> Gosh. Again, the reading, talking, drawing thing. Not my forte. So um, the... Creating the story in, in a piece kind of comes back to what I was talking about with the background, foreground, all that stuff. But when you when you tell a story, you have a protagonist, a main character, um, protagonist, antagonist, all that jazz. Hopefully every piece you work on, even a pinup, should have a protagonist, um, maybe a question, a driving question that... that um, when you're doing screenwriting, which is another one of my things, um, you always have to have a question in every... To make a complete scene, you have to have a question that needs and gets answered um, by the protagonist. And it should, theoretically, as time changes, change the protagonist. But in this case, time isn't changing. It's a still, still picture. 
what you can do is is still have your protagonist, in this case, the Black Panther, and a driving question, a driving need, and to t- to help tell the story. And and you can, in this case, make one up since I don't have one. So it could be, you know, he is stalking, you know, some. <laughs> This is going to sound really bad. Um, one of the first things I, I, I read was a Black Panther 4-issue miniseries. Uh, I believe it was drawn by Gene Colan, I think, back in the day. And, and and this was in the, gosh, 80s, maybe early 90s, late 80s. Um, and he was fighting these super-powered people called the White Supremacists. Uh, um, and that one always stuck with me. I know it's it's... You know the PCness of it is is I don't know. Anyhow, um, so you could have him like looking down, looking at some some guys that he's gonna you know eventually show the right way and kick their asses or something. I don't know. So that's the story. But sh- just standing there looking cool isn't a story, in my opinion. It's a it, it, it's the uh, background of many a pinup these days. But I think that every pinup even should have a story that it tells. Um, just for the sake of, of giving the viewer something to invest in, something beyond just, well, that looks cool. Um, my philosophy, though. I know a lot of people really just want a cool pinup. So, um, to get back to the storytelling aspect, when you're, there are three things, in my opinion, uh, I think I learned, learned these in my art classes somewhere, three things that drive uh, your perception of a piece your your story telling your your the way you interpret a piece the first and foremost is value um, the relative light and dark within the piece things that are uh, that that creates the volume the sense of volume uh, the roundness of an object the placement even of an object you only see the objects because of the difference in value which comes to the second point. Things that have high contrast in their values will be the things that are most noticed, most important and in the scene. So say, for instance, like the eyes. And, and this may be, I don't know if this is evolutionary or just something I've noticed, but the eyes are typically white with um, like high contrast in, in, in regular people, a high contrast pupil. So you got the white on the darkest area. Um, in this piece, that doesn't happen, but I do have a f- pretty much the lightest thing. I would probably even, by the end of the piece, make these things damn near white um, with glows and stuff so that they will be next to all this v- the blackest of things. And that will draw the viewer's attention, the viewer's uh, perception of the piece into the eye area, which is what we want. We want that to be the intensest, the most intense part of it. And then when you get into things like the background, the contrast here, actually, I'm going to do a little thing that, uh, it's not a trick, it's more of a, a guide, a study guide, is turning the, turning your piece black and white. And then you can kind of squint at it and see where where's the contrast, where, where are things not coming forward, uh, not separating between the different planes. So... Things like this, where I've got a dark versus light, that really separates. Uh, you can't see my hand. I'm like gesturing on my my monitor with my hand. Uh, you see that the face here separates from the background, and then the background elements have much lower contrast and kind of blend a lot more together in the background. And that that's done to create a sense of focus, first of all, but also a sense of depth in the piece. Um, I can turn off the grayscale layer. But th- the, that is a, a check that you should do as a colorist every now and then, is check it in grayscale, uh, because your eyes get tricked easily, very easily, by the hue, the actual color name, the blue, the green, whatever, name of the color versus the value of the color, the relative black or whiteness of the dark or lightness, whatever, of of it. And as a colorist, value trumps everything. Uh, 
you can have great colors, but if there's no value, you, you the page will just flatten out and read as nothing's more important than anything else. And you've lost the number one job of the colorist, which is storytelling, in my opinion. I guess I don't need to clarify that. It is my channel. I can say whatever opinions I want. So that's why I also, you know, I have put probably more time into this face and the wrinkles and the mask than any other part because to me, that is the focus of the drawing right there. I mean, if you take percentage of canvas size, I mean, that's what? One, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven by, you know, one seventieth, <coughs> one eightieth of the drawing. Uh, so, but it is. 70% of the impact of the drawing. Anyhow, so that's my little philosophical why we, Im importance of different color things. Um, separate that out with a little bit of value. So I think this is supposed to be metallic, um, which if you study the forms, the surfaces of different types of materials, such as if you're, say you're a, a 3D modeler. I was told there wouldn't be any math. Well, yeah, I know. I try to keep it limited, I apologize. Um, it was for a philosophical point, cut me some slack. Um, just imagine if you got, my, my high school son is like doing multivariant linear algebra calculus, whatever stuff. Um, and he passed me in any sort of mathematical understanding, probably in fifth grade. So that's fine. The only thing I use every now and then is geometry to try and figure out the relative uh, ratios needed in making uh, when I'm drawing, not when I'm coloring. Coloring, I just kind of let the page do whatever it's going to do. Um, that's somebody else's job to get the proportions and, and all that stuff right. But like I was saying, with <laughs> getting back on subject, the uh, relative surface renderings of certain objects. Metallics have a very high local, uh, not localized contrast, but a um, like a specular highlight, I guess, is what, what I've been called them. So you will see something really dark, high contrast, basically. You will see something very dark, and then you'll see, like if this were, you would see a, uh, I'm just kind of putting this in, I'm not sure. It wasn't really in the drawing that way, so this may not work. But kind of high contrast to give it a shine. This isn't working at all. Let's just get rid of that. Let's go back, 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 back. I'll just do it in another effect layer on top. But you, you get kind of a glowy, a high contrast, a, 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 a sense of shine by its, not randomized, but it, its reflection of the light around it. So cleaning up some of this stuff putting in that dent where the, the muscle tucks under here. Um, certain parts of anatomy are good to know um, that this is not just flowing straight across that way, but that it actually does have a insertion point of the muscle there. Um, you can exaggerate it or not. Uh, on Philip's work, since he is so uh, conscious of the musculature and the the specific anatomy of a piece, of a, of a character's uh, imaginary, technically, an anatomy, uh, I think that it's important to represent that well in the coloring as well. If that's going to be his focus, it should also be one of my focus. Which, hey, that actually segues into another thing that I can talk about. And that is working with different line artists and how you adapt I, I'm how you adapt to working uh, over all these different styles. One thing I am 
some ugh, that's hitting my mic with my face. Sorry about that. Um, one thing I am known a little bit for is being a stylistic chameleon, uh, which has worked well in some ways and not so well in others. But um, it, 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 it can be a lot harder than saying, oh, I'm the guy who always does things uh, in this nice, you know, flat, uh, color theory driven style. I'm the guy who can do the flat stuff and then ends up doing this painterly stuff, which is great. Um, it allows me a lot of, it keeps the job from, from stagnating. Um, but when you get a different line artist that you're working with, uh, you have to adapt. Well, you don't have to. You should adapt. It's, it's respectful to adapt, uh, to say that you recognize them as a unique artist and that you support you will you will be a support in their the message they are trying to convey with their style pushing my own style onto a piece uh to me is a little bit i, I guess disrespectful is the word i want to use i i want to i want to be there and and be the best Chameleon, blend, blend, blend. Yeah, I, I <laughs> okay, I got it. Um, yeah, the the I, I want to support and draw or color in a way that makes their drawing look the best it can be, uh, so that their message comes through. So one thing I always end up doing is I kind of look at the piece and kind of look at what the what I think the intent is behind the style that they work in. Sometimes it's just their voice. Sometimes that's just the way they see the world. And they want uh, the, the artist just sees it as valued, as rendered, as, as um, see, see, sees the world in a very rounded, sculpted way. And that's, I believe, Philip works in that way because he uh, thinks that way. And then you get some people like Amignola, a prime example, who thinks in the, the graphical terms, where this type of coloring would be completely inappropriate for uh, Mignola's uh, Hellboy-style uh, line work. Um, it would be very... Not I, disrespectful doesn't work in this case. Sorry, um, but it, it it would not fit. It, it would not blend. It would not match with uh, what he intends to his drawings. He he it it would look weird to be honest. Um. So yeah, try when you when you work with a lot of different artists and and projects and. You will you will find what you are comfortable with. You will find a uh, a style that is more your view of how you see the world. But as a colorist, I think I I subvert that to what I feel the artist's view of the world, artist's view of of style is. Not to say that my style does not come through. Um, I think that anybody who not anybody. People who who have looked at my work can kind of pick my work out of a lineup if they were given, say, which one of these was Jeremy's? Uh, if if like five different people did a piece, and some of them would be able to, to say, yeah, that that's that's his style, that's his palette, that's the way he makes strokes, brush marks, um, whatever. Um, but I think I also, if somebody says, you know, which uh, on certain jobs I've done, I don't think people would think, oh, wow, that, that's that's Jeremy's work. Um, because I do tend to subvert as much as I think is fair uh, my style to the style of the line artist. That was quite the little uh, side, side discussion I did there. Sorry if I bored anybody. <laughs> um, I do get off on tangents because 
again, I, I'm not a speaker usually. I am just a, a sit in my desk and work guy. So having me actually talk, I, I just kind of say whatever is on my mind and it's kind of a train of thought sort of deal. Okay. So he has these gloves. I'm going to kind of enhance the ribbing just a hair, being mindful of where the light source is. So that one would be hitting on that side because it's coming up that way. And the light here would be hitting on this side. And sometimes those that ribbing will pretty well disappear in certain areas. Um, I think he, <laughs> what I can see of the lines, I think he did a lot of that already his, himself. Okay, <laughs> three way to mess around. Not bored, well that's good. Um, watching and thinking what I can throw your way to mess around with on the stream. That doesn't take much as you've probably noticed. Um, Hopefully, as I do more of these, I will be able to laser focus and uh, ignore the random stuff that gets thrown my way. No, actually, I like it. <laughs> I definitely have a recognized style. That's good, and and depending who I'm working on, maybe not. Uh, most most actually, I'd say that ninety. 90%, again, sorry, throwing out some math numbers there. 90% of the people I work with appreciate what I can bring in my my style. Some of them just appreciate that I can work with their style. Uh, but I think, by and large, most people, most professional artists, I guess that should be a, a key distinction. Um, I, I found that the the more amateur you go, the less collaborative the philosophy um, unfortunately, uh, I think that's something you grow into a lot of times, but I think for most professionals, they see what I bring and appreciate that, but also at the same time, probably understand and can actually see that I am bringing their piece to a, a fuller realization instead of, of my bringing my piece into their work. Uh, it's a fine balance, honestly, and, and everybody will find a different way to, to answer the question of how far of a, how much of my voice do I want to put into this thing? Um, Drass says, yeah, I found a photo that was sent to me in black and white progress that you could possibly fumble with. It isn't a scanned digital, though. A photo in black and white progress. So, like what I did with the uh, with that that thing. Yeah, I mean, the, the, there is actually that's going to be one video I do is where I take a piece that is um, in black and white and treat it kind of like the old masters. Uh, um, again, my painting background coming through. The old masters, many of them would start with black and white. They were called grisaille uh, paintings, where they they did the whole painting in black and white, and then they would glaze over it with different uh, washes of thinly diluted uh, paint, uh, some t uh, either tempera, egg tempera usually, um, or oils eventually. And uh, that is also a method you can do digitally now um, that has pretty good effects. I integrate some of that concept into the... Am I on the right layer? Yeah. Into pieces I work on every now and then. I, I, I will actually, I'm going to be doing that in part of uh, this piece eventually. When I do a painted piece, I do end up using that over my colors to bring out certain parts that I, I think uh, could use a little bit of, of color bump to make them more interesting. So one thing here is 
I'm I'm losing a. L- Oops, I don't want that there. I want that to kind of cut. I'm losing the problem. Is I'm losing some of the form of that thumb joint. Um, one thing I try to do is, and this is something I learned from. Gosh, I think Steve Lieber was telling me this one time when I was at the the studio where I used to uh, intern. He told me about he, he we were looking at somebody's drawing and he called them sausage fingers uh, and I didn't know what the hell he was talking about but he, he was basically the idea I'm gonna make a new layer here of how how the guy just kind of had these actually that's even more he, he had these really soft things instead of like if you if you square off a lot of things and create these hard edges it reads a lot uh a lot better as a as a joint um instead of if you just really round things out sometimes that doesn't read very well um so have you ever worked with a more cut and grad style that seems to be pretty popular color style um yes actually i have that was my first and yeah, i my first real professional work i was working um with hi-fi studio uh, they gave me a shot. Uh, I don't know why, but they did. Um, and they had their house style that they would hire people to to work on. Uh, it was a studio driven uh, method. And yeah, I had to, I had to basically learn the the hi fi style while doing. A DC book, uh, because I, I, they were doing had me working on. I think it was Booster Gold might have been the very first one I did, and I was so intimidated and freaking out about. I I I don't know what the hell I'm doing. Uh, this is not my natural. My natural look, and oops, wrong color. And I. I muddled my way through it. I did actually quite a few issues with them, um, but it 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 really was not a good fit for me. I was so I I just don't think in that that method. And I'm I my painting background is why I think I I come always come back to being much more uh, painterly because I just my brain doesn't work in that that method very well. But yes, I have done it. Um, it is one of my least favorite styles, but I think that people who can do it very well can do it, can get great results from it. I I just don't. Like I said, I I, I guess that's my my part of my style coming through. If you know, I kind of dismissed more of my style, but uh, painterly is how I see most of the world and art and having that show through did not did not show through very well in how I saw the cut and cut and grad or cut and brush um, as it's mostly done now it's not so much the gradient tool anymore but there are some people that do it to great effect and I I have great admiration for uh, their ability to make that style work without looking specifically dated. I know it was very popular uh, what, 90s? Uh, about the time I was not reading comics as much. I still don't know what the hell I'm doing, but I'm having fun doing it. Same here, not my favorite style of color. And yeah. I, it, it happened, I mean, it, as I understand the history behind it, um, it was done mostly because that's what computers could do at the time. Um, they were unable to uh, there, there weren't graphics tablets so much like this when it was when digital coloring was starting. Um, so it was pretty much mouse driven, and you can click around and create a a shape, and then use the paint bucket, uh, that, well the grad gradation tool, and use use that to create the these volumes. But it was mostly, as I understand it, done out of limitations of technology and not necessarily out of stylistic desire. Um, 
so I don't know. I, I, I think it it's now kind of an accepted style of what, you know, I'm going to go into my camera, quote unquote, uh, what, what that st comic book style looks like. But yeah, as I understand it, it was done mostly out of necessity and not out of desire. You know, pick out some of these little... He did do some, some rendering that I have since lost, I think, um, in in some of these folds. Um, uh, mostly... Uh, oops, stray mark. Uh, mostly it's because of uh, the JPEG compression, but I'm also... Some of it's just me. Again, this is... Uh, as you see, is the little ab... The marks on the abs there, and the pec pectoral curve, the uh, rib cage coming down the abs, the external obliques, and then it it, it actually kind of tangents into that knee there. I'll probably to keep it from being such a a smooth tangent. I'm gonna bump it in so it's more of a T shape instead of a, a Y shape. Um, yeah, that's starting to come together a little bit. Um, so Todd, Ice Pick, I didn't ever get, I couldn't find a channel for you of, of any videos. I, I I confess I, I did not do a completely thorough search. So it, um, do you have any stream videos that you got coming around anywhere? I know I know your book is, um, you have your book at all the shows, and if you want to promote where, where people can find your book or whatever, please feel free to mention that in the chat. I assume it lets you. I don't know the protocol of chat if it doesn't let you link the stuff on other people's streams, but I give you complete permission to pimp your stuff because I'm a pimp. No. Uh, Again, pulling in some of these, sharpening, cleaning up some of the edges. I still have not even remotely touched that hand. I think I'm afraid of it. I'm afraid of hands, honestly, uh, in, in coloring world. No, I was not beat as a child or anything. But um, they, <laughs> the structure of them, uh, it, it, it's, it's, I can't seem to get my head around it very well. I know I could study it and figure it out, but... I'll be damned if, if it's something I really ever put that much effort into. So I'm, I'm pulling some of the light into his shadow rendering here. Um, I'll probably, I'm going to create a harder edge. Where's it nice? I'm going to do solid black here. Create a harder edge against the, the strong rim light here to really make that uh, contrast, but up in here where it's uh, actually supposed to be across a rounded surface of the ab muscle, I'm going to kind of round that out. And then kind of back up that color, that shape with a, with a harder black. So, yeah, I, might, I don't know. His, an <laughs> his anatomy, this is understatement of the year. Uh, his anatomy is better than mine. And so the way I am uh, putting in these abs, based on my knowledge, very well may be the completely wrong thing to do. So, uh, again, if I, if I were working on this for print or publication, before I did, not before, but probably after I did all this, I would send it to Philip and say, dude, Correct me on anything that I fucked up of your piece because the odds are very much, the odds are in my favor that I did something wrong. Um, hi, you're a funny guy. No videos yet. I did record me coloring an alien piece by Buddy Drew, uh, but never posted it anywhere. Oh man, Jeremy, you are too kind. Well, yeah, I've, I've had so many 
people help me. I, I, I do not, that, hard for me to explain here. I have been very fortunate to know a lot of very cool comic people. Uh, very cool people, period. But specifically comic people who had zero reason to to do anything nice for me, um, but did, just because they saw something in me, maybe, or just that's just who they are. Um, did you set your OBS to save your recording to your channel? Yes, I did this time, so hopefully it will show up. I also have it set to record um, and save the recording so I can do put it on YouTube or edit or something like that in the in the future. Thanks for reminding me, Dras. Um, but back to to Ice Pick's comment. Uh, I I I'm a I'm a I guess it's technically paying it back. I'm kind of a pay it forward guy, but I, I pay it back too. Um, I've had so many people treat me so well over the years that if I did not respect that generosity and be as as nice or as positive or as supportive as I possibly could be, it would be, and I mean, I'm not a faith and karma type guy, but it'd be really bad karma uh, <laughs> to, to um, not repay the favor. Uh, I, I just think that that's part of life is, is the relationships we build define the quality of our life. I'm getting very philosophical. I get that way sometimes uh, when I color and have nothing else to talk about. But um, yeah, I've had I've had so many people be so good to me that it's just Im impossible for me to c conceive of not being that way to other people. Um, I mean, granted, I have had the occasional. Uh, well, dick, honestly, uh, in the industry. But those are very far and few between, and I do not measure the totality of my good l fortune, my uh, positivity that I've received from the industry based on a, a, a couple of douches. I will not say names because I don't want to do that. Uh, here's a link to the standard book. I do have two variant covers, and folks who are interested can email or PM on Facebook. Email address is Todd Rayner, and you get the link there. Awesome. Yes, please, people, check out Todd. He is a great guy. He has offered me table space when I was uh, shut out of a show. Um, he, he's been a great supporter. He always has a positive attitude in, on life and creation, uh, creating comics. I don't know what his creation philosophy is but um but yeah St stellar upstanding guy deserves great respect and uh support from anybody who believes that comics can be a joyful and rewarding personally rewarding life choice okay i've gone on long enough about todd he's probably blushing in his seat saying, Jeremy, shut the hell up. Um, that's okay. Because that's what people have done to me before, too. And I'm like, uh, awkward. Okay. Thanks, Drask. Go take a look at it. Um, eh, too much. Blend that back in. So we got some abs. That really... <sighs> that's too distracting. First of all, I think well, because of the way the light source is coming. So let's see. We got light coming in. This way. And I've got a secondary light coming in. I, oddly enough, I picked opposite colors for the light. Okay. Um, so yeah, I've got that coming in. So I think those would hit hit on here and these would hit there but it just doesn't look right and sometimes that's I'm sure that has to do with my lack of understanding of the anatomy um, probably because the abs tend to be in an inset caved in sort of this here is usually 
a little bit recessed compared to a lot of the other stuff um, because, you know, the nice flat abs. So, I don't know. I, I'll, I'll probably go back into that and I can get rid of that layer. Um, actually, I'm just going to fuddy those things back down to a much more or much less prominent. That yeah, works. I, yeah, whatever. <laughs> Sorry, Philip. Um, okay. So, one, one, one thing about doing a live stream, you guys get to see how completely full of bullshit I am about uh, some of the decisions I make, where I'm like, I don't know, I'm just doing it this way because I think that's the way it works. Uh, that's okay. I That's honesty, man. Anybody who says they know what the hell they're doing all the time, I do not trust those people. Now I now I am like, tell more people about it after I read it. Good, yeah, support him. But yeah, that goes that goes through my my channel. Uh, I mean, hopefully I know you a little bit uh, before you start promoting your work in my my stream. But um, this is to me this is kind of like the ultimate community time. Uh, not a jam necessarily, but sharing uh, our what we're doing, how we how we are, uh, things that we hope will succeed, that sort of stuff. I think that is kind of what I what I hope my channel can be is a bit of a a little slash inspiration, a little education, and you know a little bit of fun here and there. Um, unfortunately, a little bit of math thrown in there. I apologize again for that. I, I didn't mean to drive anybody away with the, the numbery stuff. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I am very much about education. I think I've mentioned probably ad nauseum. You guys are probably sick of hearing it. But I like um, helping out other artists in an educational sense. I used to. I don't anymore now that my kids are out of the, the younger grades. Uh, the volunteering seems to have dried up a bit, but I used to volunteer heavily, uh, like weekly, in the school system, and I think that that is probably one of the most rewarding things I ever did in life. Uh, I mean, I volunteered for the Humane Society fostering baby kittens and stuff, um, but teaching other, teaching kids to draw is the, in my opinion, the, the pinnacle of being an artist is sharing that with um, the next generation. You know. What are we at? We're almost at 2 o'clock here? Okay. I am not... I don't really have a schedule for when I stop. Um, I do need to... <laughs> I'm running to Costco after this to get some uh, passport photos taken, which is why I'm actually dressed... It with my hair done today, I know, crazy. Um, I don't normally. Normally, you <laughs> that's one reason, other than the distraction of having my camera, uh, my picture over there. Hey, thanks for ordering there, Dress. That's that's really cool. Now, if, if I can't remember, are you you're not in the Northwest area, uh, Pacific Northwest America, but if you ever get out our way, uh, definitely. Meet me up at a show. I'd love to like do dinner or something like that. I I, I like going out with people I I know online, but um, don't know necessarily very much in person. So, but especially those who are so willing to, you know, blind. Well, I don't say blindly, but support another artist just because they seem like a good guy. And you know, so yeah, thank you for doing that. Um, yeah. So it's starting to come, come together. Um, I have not touched the background like I said I was going to do. I have not touched that hand, and this stuff is not going anywhere at the moment either. <laughs> so I should probably just take some of this and just blend out those marks like I wanted. Sample. Sample blend, sample blend, and there we go. 
again, this is using the hard round brush requires more samples to blend versus the chalk brush. Um, so that is one benefit I, I like of the chalk brush is, is blending. But I also think you get it, you get a different aesthetic by using the hard round brush. You get a, I don't want to say more controlled, but more, I mean, it is more controlled. There is definitely that. But uh, the, the idea of having a, a, I guess that's how, how I am not making sense here. The, the way I see, I, I see people doing concept art, which is another thing that I really enjoy is doing concept art. Um, they often will, will work with uh, a hard round brush. Um, you live in Florida. Oh, man. I, I, I never get out there. <laughs> um, my, my shows are, at this point, uh, very local. I don't like flying. Um, I, I know that's a point. I've done it a few times. I used to like it, and then I uh, did a really, really bad flight experience on uh, Southwest Airlines to Texas one time to visit a friend of mine, and that soured me mightily on the whole concept of air travel. And I have been phobic, I guess would be the best term, ever since. Um, I have flown for family trips, but that is the exception and definitely not the rule. Um, that show is crazy. Rose City in Portland's a great show. Um, I'll be there this year. Not sure if Jeremy will. Um, Rose City, I doubt I will be there next uh what is that no in in the fall is the next show in rose city i've been there i think the last two or three times and i think ron brister the 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 organizer wants to bring in some new talent for that um i mean i guess i could uh, set up like as a t you know get a table of my own and not be a guest but um I, I agree that he, with him wanting to kind of rotate the talent, even though I am local and it's very cheap, basically just a, a table cost for me. Uh, but I, I am doing Emerald City. Um, and Emerald City is, this is the first time I have been an official pre arranged guest um granted i had to pay for it usually i just i knew uh jim demonicos and he just was like yeah i can get you a table if somebody cancels and somebody always cancels at the last minute because you know life and so i always went that way but this year i actually went the, the, the regular route and got a real table and uh will be set up properly at uh, dd12 Anyhow, um, you can share. Uh, you can share your table. I might do that. I might take you up on it. We will see closer to the time. Um, if I remember right, they're going down to six foot tables, though. So I, I don't think <laughs> you're gonna have a whole lot of room to, uh, to sit me down anywhere. But thank you for the offer. We will uh, definitely keep in touch. I'm sure we'll keep in touch as as it gets closer. Um, so we got a little bit, so there's a muscle, that, the big muscle that goes across the top, and then there's a couple flanking muscles here, and it looks like that's what he's pulling. It's the highlight of that bulge, especially with the knee bent up like that. That muscle would um, contract and, and bulge right there. So I'm going to try and accentuate that as best I can without losing some of the shape of the other one. Yeah, it works a little bit. Southwest is not a good airline to travel. Yeah, yeah, I've realized that. Um, not my wife now travels for work a lot, um, and she she uh, occasionally, uh, every now and then she'll she we're on the west coast obviously, and and her territory for her job is pretty much um, from Hawaii, Alaska to. Colorado, and now a bit of Texas. So she flies a lot. And uh, Alaska is her preferred uh, United, uh, not United. Uh, maybe it is United. I don't know. 
she flies all sorts, but she, occasionally she will have to fly southwest and is like, okay, we'll do it. <laughs> so, yeah. Uh, that's crazy. Six foot dinner. Yeah, dinner at Emerald City. Definitely. We will. I know, um, well, I can't say definitely. Um, very likely. I know that DC has people coming. Um, and they've been asking me what my schedule looks like. So I, I will, if they want to do anything with me, obviously I will be taking them up on that offer. But um, at, at that point, um, we'll be able to definitely figure things out. I have so probably a DC dinner, a colorist's dinner that Kelly Fitzpatrick and, and Marissa, uh, never pronounce her last name right, so I'll just call her Marissa, uh, put on and that I will be going to. But I think that's only two of the... See, I'll be up there Thursday night, Friday night, Saturday night. So, yeah, I'll probably have one night available. <laughs> so, yeah, we'll, we'll try and figure something out. Um, yeah. Firm up that heel a little bit. So, still avoiding that hand right there, yep. Um, I'm going to blend out the render lines on the cape in the background here. Smooth those folds, because folds are not a hard edge thing. I mean, they are in the line drawing, obviously, but not in uh, in the real world. Put some of that there. Put the other part of the cape, I assume it's the cape up here, right there. Um, bring in some of the background to separate out that shape. So if the light is, a little back on the learning side of things, if the light is coming from this bottom angle, this area right here would not get as much light as this area. So, trying to be conscious of that. I should not make these quite as bright. I probably don't need to go that qu quite as much. This is more in the in the, because I'm I'm painting it instead of coloring it. If I was coloring it, I wouldn't really the line work would would control so much of of how we see that part there that it would not matter. That's uh, too much contrast there. It's drawing the eye. Again, that you can use contrast to um, draw the eye, or you can use lack of contrast to make it not that important to the viewer. Because um, right now, to me, this area here is reading way too contrasty um, in comparison to to its its actual importance to the piece. So I am going to paint over and knock it down a bit. And smooth out the contrast so it's not as sharp of an edge. Later in the piece, I may go back and, and readjust this because that's kind of how I work, is I push and pull until I find what I think works. Um, Yeah, that's better. That 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 definitely tones it down, um, forces the eye back up into the um, more important place up here in the face. Which, if I really was smart, which I am now going to try and be, I would put that hard rim light. I'm going to call it a rim light um, on the face here to draw some of that attention back up to there. And that would be on this one as well, theoretically. There. Yeah. And I will need to put a lot of it back, you know, in certain areas, like on the, blend that in a little bit. To give the cape a little bit of, or the, not a, yeah, I guess it's the cape, the, Whatever the hell that stuff is, it's on here. Uh, and put a strong there. There. 
Um, on the, these are supposed to be metallic spikes. Um, so we'll, or metallic um, claws, I think. And so I will, I will be having to, to mess with them a bit. Okay, um, Dras. Well, I would say the best con to try and be a part of is MegaCon Orlando. I have heard very good things about that. I would love to attend it. If you ever end up in South Florida, I'd be more than willing to meet up. Best con in Florida. All right. Um, yeah, uh, I, I I would love to travel more. Um, it's just, it, it it's not them. It's me. Um, I just, yeah. I'm trying, and I have gotten better. I've I've become much more logical about the whole airline is not trying to kill me thing. Um, so yeah, that should be all yellow. All right, I'm going to tackle this hand. It's taunted me long enough. For me, the trouble the trouble on this one is, and I've, I, I think I, I've been letting my subconscious process it for a while here. That's probably why I've, I've not started it, um, is trying to make sure the planes of the hand, which are complicated uh, in the best of times, are logically placed in my coloring um, because the hand is rotating, first of all. So that creates it a, a, a com complication to the, um, to the forms. The hand is uh, contracting, uh, squeezing, in effect. Not quite a fist. Fists are easy. But an open, gripping sort of look. Um, and that uh, creates more unique shapes that I am not used to seeing. Um, no matter how many, I mean, I've, I've colored a lot of hands, but a lot of times they are either closed or open. This shape is, this, this, this take, this, this pose of the hand is more complex than the standard. Uh, it's a great one. Um, I think it it actually it it works very well for the piece, but it's more complex. And then adding in you have ribbing with texture apparently, and uh, on on the the material of the glove, and then a dual light source um, for each one of those planes. So it's basically a very big puzzle that gives me a lot of opportunity to fuck up. So hopefully that is not going to be the case. And I can read things properly. I am going to pull some of this yellow and start... Actually, I want to see his lines a little better. So I'm going to put the lines over top here and see if I can... get a better sense of where, actually I could just turn that on and off. No, nope, I can't. Um, and I'm just gonna kinda, you can't see it because it's underneath the line work, but I'm just kinda tracing around the outside edges of these fingers and trying to find their, their edges so that then when I put that back down, back down there I think, Maybe back down there. Yeah, I think it was there. Okay. Um, I can. You can see now. I've got these hard hard lines as structure guides for the fingers. Um, oop, I'm on the line layer. That is the hazard of of my process of working with so many layers. Is it just becomes, sometimes it becomes very hard to remember uh, which layer you're on. And that can create a few problems. 
The least of which is is when you go to adjust or hide layers, you are doing the wrong layer. So on that side of the ribbing, because of the way the light source is, this is coming around. I think that the light would probably hit up through underneath the thumb at this angle. Put a little bit there. I don't want to overstate this this light, the the cool or the the yellow light, because it's I don't want it to dominate the piece. I want it to be a, a more of a rim light and not a, a universal light. So yeah. I'm just kind of pulling it to places that I think would hit or I or I want to separate, I should say, by it hitting. Okay. So that puts some of the that brings it into focus a little bit. Oh sorry. Uh there's always a road trip. A road trip to South Florida from Portland and <laughs> Vancouver, Washington. That I, I've uh, my parents have done that actually. Uh, uh, when I was little, we used to take road trips to the East Coast, um, all the way across everywhere, um, and that was those are great memories. But those were a lot of car time. And I'm not sure that is something I am willing to do. Um, if I, I have taken, when I was young and poor high school, college student, I took a, a Greyhound um, across the country, well, to North Dakota, and that was a 24-hour solid bus ride. Um, not because that's how long it takes to get to North Dakota, but because it has to stop at every damn, well... Every, every every little place along the way gets its own bus stop, and they're always in the, the great locations that you really want to visit. That's sarcasm. You don't want to be anywhere near most of those bus stops. Um, so the muscle, the way, um, okay, this is a uh, bus rides. Oof, that wasn't pleasant. Yeah, not, no kidding. Um, so when you... Rotate the arm. Uh, um, the muscles, the bones in them actually cross over and pull the muscles in this diagonal. Um, if you if your hand was rotated in, where uh, you can't see me again, I'm gesturing. If your hand was rotated inward, you can't. You would. Um, the bones would be lined up straight, but because this is turned outward, you get a little bit of a, a an X shape here. So that's what I'm trying to to kind of exaggerate a little bit so that it reads as the bones within defining some of the structure. Um, I think that's probably something Philip would uh, want you know uh, shown want, want uh, pronounced. Is is the the actual musculature that I'm not softening the the shape too much. Um, I am putting a bit of a softer touch on it than he he did. Um, mostly in the, you know kind of in the folds in the pads. Um, I don't want to make it too. I don't want it to be a, as strong as this guy up here because it's pushed back and there's. Theoretically, if the light is coming from up here and going down, the body would be blocking some of it. But I am going to pop certain parts just because I think that that is important to the um, the story of the piece. Uh, again, I, I always, not always, I, I'm going back to the story concept where we still need to, to recognize that this hand has a purpose in the story, that it's not just part of the... Um, part of the anatomy. He's not just drawing, oh, that, I have to have that hand there because that's what anatomically is supposed to happen. Now, I think that this hand represents part of the story. He is, you know, tensed. He is ready. He's, um, you know, he's, 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 he's potentially going to be, like, grabbing something and jumping and grabbing the bad guys. Uh, all sorts of stuff could be the reason for this this slightly tensed hand to be 
ready ready to do its 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 business here um so yeah i think that that i i need to treat it with the the storytelling respect um as well as the anatomical respect um that it's due and again because i my anatomy isn't the strongest i end up doing the best i can um and fortunately, Philip here has given me very strong information about what that anatomy that I don't know would or should look like. Um, other people that do that very well that I just popped into my head would be specifically Matthew Clark um, is very good um, about giving you the anatomical information you need. Um, uh, Freddie Williams, I guess, goes without saying that his uh, anatomy is right there, available and ready to be shown. Um, so respect that. That's why when you look at my Batman Turtle stuff, it is so heavily focused on the anatomy of the characters because that, to me, is one of Freddie's storytelling styles. That that's what part of the story to him is the anatomy of the of the characters. So I trying to get that color. So the light is bouncing and hitting the folds theoretically. Uh got to use that word a lot, sorry. Uh theoretically I use that word a lot. Um Now you guys will be like, "Oh my god, all he says is theoretically." That's okay. fingers there and there a lot of this uh, around the edges here is those um, fragments basically the, the JPEG fragments from the scan that when I enlarged created a, a mess basically um, Yeah, that works for that hand. It's I mean it's not it's not perfect, um, obviously. Theoretically. Um, but I believe that getting the correct anatomy onto any character is so important. I see so many artists that mess up the anatomy of a character. Yeah, um um one of the reasons why I'm not a line artist, because I don't feel I can do it the justice it deserves to actually give the character the right anatomy that it's supposed to have. Um, there are some people that, that the anatomy is not as important to their storytelling, though, too, where, you know, you get... Who am I thinking? Uh, like a... Well, like a Mignola, where it's the more the graphic. He still has good anatomy. You look at it, and you're like... Um, yeah, I think <laughs> here we go. Ice pick is like I wonder at what point it's the anat the style versus bad anatomy. Yeah, um, yeah. You get like people like Omin, Michael Omin. You get people like Mignola. Some of the very graphical, stylistic people. Um, I think their anatomy can be a little. Um, I don't want not wonky because it's that's not the term, but it, they they can fudge the anatomy for the story. People like um, like Freddie, uh, their anatomy should be very solid because that's what is one of the key moments, key key uh, pillars of their storytelling. Um, but yeah, I agree that there there is if you are wanting anatomical accuracy, then if that's one of your goals then your success needs to be measured upon how accurate you are. If that is not something that is your goal, then that is that is style and I think can can be not necessarily even forgiven, but uh discounted as not really that important to this to the overall story. Um but 
if you're if if something you profess is to say that my anatomy is important to me, then you should have good anatomy. Um, there are some people that are definitely style style over substance artists who have been very famous uh, and successful over the years where their anatomy is not good, uh, not accurate, I should say. Um, if but they don't care because that's not their their intent. So for me, a lot. Of, uh, th this is also coming from my um, my art and art history background. Is intent to me is a very large measure um, uh, of success. If you if you tell the story in the style that you intended, then I can forgive an awful lot. If you're using it as a crutch to say, well, that's just my style. I have come across people like that too, that they're not that they're not professing to be um, quality draftsmen. They're just saying, well, I'm making an excuse for my my lack of anatomical understanding. Even though it looks like I'm trying, I'm not. I'm not doing this stylistically. I'm trying. I'm just not doing it very good. But I'm going to call it style because I don't want to really take the effort to learn it and then break the rule. Um, that's a different. Uh, I've read some self-published comics that don't have the best anatomy, but the style I suppose worked out for the route they went with the story. Yes. Yeah. I, I like I speak. I agree. Um, having. If it works for the story, um, and that's that's your goal, like I said, if, goal and intent, um, intent is very important to me. Um, I think that, actually, I think, uh, I think that's the foot there. Again, is it this, I think he intended this just kind of to fade to nothing. So um, we'll fade into the, the structure of everything else. So I think that's probably why I'm having a little bit more difficulty reading some of this area because it was not, first of all, important to him. Um, and second of all, it, it is looser than it than he probably he would have done if he was doing a final finished piece. Yeah. All that stuff should probably start fading into nothing. A little bit of cape shadow there, just to give the foot a little bit more structure. Um, should be all pretty well shadowy through here. You can see I'm on on this section. I am not nitpicky finessing very much. I'm doing a largely um, big brush strokes. Um, some general value work, but not getting in real tight. You can usually tell how important an area is to me by how much I zoom. <laughs> uh, if I'm not zooming, I am finding it to be also information. How's that? Uh, not, not the information that is Im most important to the piece. I try not to dismiss it entirely as, as not important, but not as important. And I'm noticing a lot, you guys can't, I don't know if you can pick up the microphone sound, but my uh, Cintiq is getting so worn out that it has a um, kind of a scratchy sound to it on the surface right now. My, my nibs and my... Um, screen are, are getting pretty well worn out and I'm, I'm, I haven't noticed it that much until the last couple weeks um, which is good that the new uh, Cintiq hopefully comes out soon so that I can upgrade and get 4k wonderfulness and widescreen this is uh, a 4x3 screen um, as you can tell by the stream not being full on widescreen uh, so yeah. Um, you know what? I think because I do have errands to run, I might. And I've been doing this for like an hour and a half, which is 
I don't know, good? I, I, I don't know what streamers usually do. So, um, yeah, uh, I think I might give this one a rest for a while. That actually shouldn't be connected there. And come back. Gosh, I don't want to wait till Tuesday to finish. Because, I mean, I, I, I told my wife I was going to stream on Tuesdays and Thursdays, so... We'll see about that. Um, I don't think your mic sounds bad. I'm not sure if you would be more comfortable using a stand-up mic versus the one you're using currently. Uh, yeah, I do. My my boys both have nice big, you know, like a not Blue Yeti. They have yeah, right clicked. Um, they have the the full the full mics because that's what they do. Um, this one, I just pulled another headset. Not the same headset I used last time. Um, the other one was was the one my wife actually uses more often. But uh, I don't know. It, it, we'll see. If I continue doing these things, um, I might take the time and, and invest in something a little more, not professional, but uh, a little easier. And it's... Uh, uh, not the most comfortable thing. <laughs> I'm not used to wearing headphones that much, so I'd rather not if I could avoid it. Okay. Um, so yeah, I, I, I'm going to actually call this one for the day. I will do another session. I thought this was going to be the... I was only going to do a two-parter. Oh, thanks. The hand turned out good. Uh, I was I, I was a little worried, but thank you. Um, I was going to do it as a two-parter, but I think it, it needs a third part to uh, spend the time on. Specifically, I think the foreground needs a lot of work um, to make it anything other than just a rough blob of stuff. Um, and the background needs a little bit of cleanup. I'm going to keep it loose, but try and put a little bit more structure in there. So, okay. Um, yeah, Dras, go ahead and actually, I'm going to push that out of the way. And my email that is available for anybody is jeremyrcallwell at gmail.com. It's in the link in the chat there. Um, yeah, always, you know, shoot me emails, um, send me stuff, preferably not huge attachments, preferably not viruses if anybody can avoid it. Um, uh, we transfer is good for big files. Um, Dropbox links are good. Uh, that sort of stuff. But yeah, I'm always happy to look at every uh, anything. And uh, I don't know if I'll ever be able to do anything with it, but I am always happy to look at stuff. So yeah, that's going to be it for today. And let me see if I can end this thing properly this time. Last time it went about 10 minutes over and you got to see me talking with my son and stuff. That's why I had to uh, mess mess with the edit and, and upload it again. So all right. So until next time, you guys uh, be good to each other. And I will see you on, most of you, on Facebook, Twitter, and such. And if not, I will see you next Tuesday at 1 o'clock. Later.